North America is home to the Great Lakes System, one of the largest freshwater systems on Earth. And these lakes help shape the local climate, ecology, economy, as well as its history. This includes Lake Superior, Huron, Michigan, Erie, and Ontario. But nearby, there's another lake that's larger than Lake Ontario and nearly as large as Lake Erie. And it sits in the heart of one of the continent's most important watersheds. But it's often overlooked and nobody considers it a great lake. I'm referring to Lake Winnipeg, a massive body of water that stretches across central Canada. It's over 24,000 square kilometers and the 11th largest freshwater lake in the world. It's fed by a drainage basin that covers nearly 1 million square kilometers. And yet, when people think of North America's greatest lakes, Winnipeg rarely makes this list. So in this video, let's talk about the geography of what I call the forgotten or other Great Lake of North America. And as always, this is Ali and welcome back to Urban Atlas. So why is Lake Winnipeg not considered a great lake? We'll discuss this a little bit later. But for now, let's talk about the imposing geography of Lake Winnipeg. It's roughly in the longitudinal center of North America. The lake is approximately 420 kilometers long from north to south. The lake is made up of two primary basins, the northern basin and the southern basin. The maximum width of the northern basin is 100 kilometers while the southern basin is remarkably narrow, with a maximum width of just 40 kilometers. The northern and southern basin are connected through a narrow channel just two and a half kilometers wide. Interestingly, this channel is also the deepest point of the lake, approximately 36 meters deep. And this part of the lake is known as the Narrows. This gives Lake Winnipeg an unusual elongated shape. Both the southern basin and the northern basin are quite shallow, relatively speaking. The southern basin being the shallower of the two. It's also significantly warmer and more productive biologically. Together, the lake has an average depth of about 12 meters. And as I mentioned previously, it has a maximum depth of 36 meters. Now, to put this into perspective, Lake Winnipeg's surface area is larger than Lake Ontario and nearly the size of Lake Erie. But the interesting part is because it's so shallow, it actually holds far less water than any of the traditional Great Lakes. Lake Erie, despite being slightly larger in surface area, contains significantly more water than Lake Winnipeg. Now, this shallowness is a defining characteristic of Lake Winnipeg. And this shallowness has implications for both the lake's ecology as well as the lake's water quality. The lake's shallowness affects how this lake responds to both natural processes and human impacts. A shallow lake warms faster in summer, mixes more completely, and is more vulnerable to problems like algal blooms, something we'll refer to later. To fully understand the geography of Lake Winnipeg, we need to go back to approximately 10 to 12,000 years ago when this lake was formed. During the Pleistocene Epoch, massive ice sheets covered much of Canada, including all of Manitoba. This was the Laurentide Ice Sheet. As this ice sheet advanced and retreated, it carved out and scraped the landscape, creating basins and depressions in the bedrock and deposited sediments. When the ice finally melted, these depressions filled with meltwater, creating what geologists call pro-glacial lakes, lakes that form at the margins of retreating glaciers. You see, during that time, Lake Winnipeg was actually part of a much larger lake known as Glacial Lake Agassiz. And when I say much larger, I mean incomprehensibly massive. Lake Agassiz, at its maximum extent, covered an area larger than all of the modern Great Lakes combined. It basically acted as an inland sea, covering parts of Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Minnesota, and North Dakota. I previously made a video on Lake Agassiz itself. If you're interested in learning more about this lake, please check out my video on Lake Agassiz. Lake Agassiz had multiple drainage events, but when it finally drained for good around 7,000 years ago, what remained were several smaller daughter lakes, Lake Winnipeg, Lake Manitoba, Lake Winnipegosis, and several others. That flat, fertile plain surrounding these lakes, including the famous Red River Valley, are the former bottom of Lake Agassiz, covered in rich sediment deposited over millennia. And this glacial heritage explains Lake Winnipeg's shallow depth, 
The lake basin itself sits at only about 217 meters above sea level, quite low for a lake so far inland. Now previously I mentioned the size of Lake Winnipeg's watershed. It receives water from an absolutely enormous drainage basin, covering approximately 980,000 square kilometers. This makes it one of the largest watersheds in North America, drawing water from parts of four Canadian provinces and four US states. Just to get a better idea as to how large this watershed is, water that falls as rain or snow in the Rockies of Alberta can eventually find its way to Lake Winnipeg via the Saskatchewan River system. Water from the farmlands of North Dakota and Minnesota flow north through the Red River, and water from northwestern Ontario arrives via the Winnipeg River, draining Lake of the Woods and the vast boreal forest beyond. Now there's three major inflows into Lake Winnipeg, these being the Red River, the Saskatchewan River, and the Winnipeg River. These three river systems alone account for most of the water entering Lake Winnipeg, but there are of course dozens of smaller rivers and streams as well. Altogether, the watershed includes diverse terrain, mountains, foothills, prairies, parkland, boreal forests, and the Canadian Shield. Interestingly, Lake Winnipeg only has one outlet. All that water stored within Lake Winnipeg all flows out through the Nelson River. Located at the north end of Lake Winnipeg, it runs northeast towards Hudson Bay and eventually the Arctic Ocean. And this is precisely why Lake Winnipeg isn't considered part of the Great Lakes system. While the Great Lakes drain southeast towards the Atlantic via the St. Lawrence River, Lake Winnipeg drains north towards the Arctic. It's part of an entirely different hydrological system. The Nelson River itself is a powerful waterway, dropping approximately 200 meters in elevation as it travels roughly 650 kilometers to the Hudson Bay. Lake Winnipeg's geography has created a unique ecosystem but also made it vulnerable to environmental pressures. Remember how I mentioned how Lake Winnipeg is extremely shallow and that affects its water quality? The shallow southern basin, which is usually warmed by summer sun and enriched by nutrients from the vast agricultural watershed, is incredibly productive. Historically, this made Lake Winnipeg one of the most important commercial fisheries in Canada. Species like walleye, whitefish, and northern pike supported both indigenous communities as well as commercial fishing operations. But this productivity does come with a cost. The same shallow water that supports fish populations are also prone to algal blooms, especially when nutrient levels rise. In the 1990s, Lake Winnipeg first started experiencing algal blooms, particularly cyanobacteria or blue-green algae. These blooms can cover huge portions of the lake's surface during the late summer, turning the water a murky green, creating foul odors and producing toxins that can harm both wildlife and humans. The main culprit is excess nutrients, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus. They enter the lake from its massive watershed, and these nutrients come from multiple sources like agricultural fertilizers washing off farmland, municipal sewage treatment plants, and livestock operations. Remember that massive watershed I mentioned previously? Well, that includes some of the most intensively farmed land in North America. The Red River Valley itself is incredibly productive agricultural land, growing everything from wheat to canola to potatoes and sugar beets. When fertilizer is applied to these fields, some portions inevitably wash off during rain or snowmelt, which makes its way to the lake eventually. The problem is then compounded by Lake Winnipeg's geography. Because it's so shallow, nutrients aren't buried in deep sediment, they remain in the water column, available for algae to use. And because the lake is elongated north to south, winds can pile algae up along shorelines. And because the lake has a massive watershed relative to its volume, the lake has a short residence time. Which means water cycles through relatively quickly, but so do nutrients, creating a continuous supply of food for the algae. Now this has become a major economic and environmental concern. Beach closures affect tourism and recreation, Property values along the lake decline, the commercial fishery faces significant challenges, and indigenous communities that have relied on the lake for thousands of years watch their traditional food sources become threatened. Since its inception, Lake Winnipeg has been central to human life in this region. You see, indigenous populations were living here even before Lake Winnipeg was formed, during the times of Lake Agassiz. 
The lake now sits at the traditional territories of several indigenous nations, including the Cree and the Ojibwe, who have fished, traveled, and lived along the shores of this lake for thousands of years. And for those communities, the lake isn't just a body of water. It's a source of food, a highway for travel, and a sacred place woven into stories, ceremonies, and identity. Today, several distinct communities dot Lake Winnipeg's shores, each with its own character and history. Gimli, on the western shore of the South Basin, is perhaps the most well-known. Founded by Icelandic immigrants in 1875, it's the largest Icelandic community outside of Iceland itself. The town celebrates its heritage with festivals, museums, and even Icelandic language signs. Hekla village, located on Hekla Island in the lake, was originally settled by Icelandic fishermen and is now part of the Hekla Grindstone Provincial Park. As you travel north, communities become far more remote. They're accessible only by boat, ice road in the winters, or float plains. The northern reaches of Lake Winnipeg remain relatively wild, with few settlements and much of the shoreline consisting of boreal forest, rocky Canadian shields, and wetlands. The lake also serves as a major recreational destination for Manitobans, particularly those of Winnipeg, which is only about an hour's drive south of the lake. So why isn't Lake Winnipeg considered part of the Great Lakes? Well, the simple answer is geography and hydrology. The five Great Lakes that I mentioned previously form an interconnected system draining via the St. Lawrence River to the Atlantic Ocean. They share these characteristics, and they're all deeper than Lake Winnipeg. They're all also in the same watershed, and they're bordered by both the US and Canada. Lake Winnipeg, while it's comparable in size to the Great Lakes, drains north the Hudson Bay and the Arctic Ocean. It's entirely within Canada. But there's an argument to be made that Lake Winnipeg deserves recognition as a Great Lake in its own right. If not as part of the official Great Lake system, then at least in terms of its importance and scale. It's massive. Its watershed is continental in scope. It provides ecosystem services, economic benefits, and cultural values to millions of people. And the environmental challenges it faces are every bit as serious as those facing the Great Lakes. One of the main reasons I consider Lake Winnipeg so important is that it acts as a barometer for an entire region. Because its watershed is so vast, it includes so many different land uses, from wilderness to intensive agriculture to major cities. What happens to Lake Winnipeg tells us something about what's happening across a huge portion of North America's interior. You see, those algal blooms aren't just a Lake Winnipeg problem. They're a symptom of how we're managing land and water across the prairies. The challenges facing Lake Winnipeg's fishery reflects broader changes in freshwater ecosystems across the continent. And the work being done to restore and protect Lake Winnipeg could provide lessons for managing other large, shallow lakes around the world. So Lake Winnipeg may not be a great lake in the official sense, but it's undeniably great in its own right from its origins in the meltwater of a glacial lake, to its role as the collecting point for one of North America's largest watersheds, and from its importance to indigenous people for millennia, to its ongoing environmental challenges, Lake Winnipeg is a geographic marvel that deserves far more attention than it typically receives. So I call Lake Winnipeg the forgotten Great Lake, sitting at the crossroads of a continent, flowing north towards the Arctic and deserving of a place in the conversation about North America's truly remarkable bodies of water. And as always, if you like content like this, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel if you have not done so already, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.